everyone, and welcome to the next webinar in our Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things just to make sure you get the most out of attending today's webinar. If you are experiencing technical issues, please let us know about those using the chat box or by emailing me at krogers at ASPB.org. If you are having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all of the associated materials within a few days. If you have questions during today's webinar, please let us know about those using the GoToWebinar chat box. Today's talks will each be 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of questions. Dr. Caitlin Burt is a research group leader within the Division of Plant Science at the Australian National University and is here with us today to take your questions and read them aloud to our panelists. Caitlin studies mechanisms in plants that influence environmental stress tolerance, such as salinity and drought tolerance. Her current research focus is investigating the physiological roles of specific subsets of a type of membrane intrinsic protein in plants called aquaporins, which influence water, salt, and nutrient transport. Thank you, Caitlin, for joining us. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are joining us today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. This webinar is part of our virtual research talk series, Plante Presents, that we created in response to the closure of most universities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please visit our webpage for more information on this series and sign up if you'd like to be considered as a speaker. You can find us on social media at plantate underscore org and at ASPB. For those of you listening to this as a recording, feel free to reach out on Twitter with your follow-up questions or comments using the hashtag plantate presents. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm now gonna turn it over to Caitlin to introduce our speakers and moderate today's session. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Katie. Welcome everyone to today's Plante Presents webinar. These webinars are a fantastic resource for our ASPB community, and we are very grateful for the effort that Benjamin, Jurgen, Katie, and Mary have put into making this webinar series happen. And thank you to our esteemed speakers for today. We have distinguished Professor Graham Farquhar from the Australian National University, and Assistant Professor Senia Krasaliva from the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you for prioritising sharing your research with all of us today. So Graham and I are joining you from the Gunnawal country and this week in Australia it's Reconciliation Week which means we're pausing and focusing on ensuring that the wrongs of the past will never be repeated and that a future can be created that is free of division and inequality. So first up we have Graham if we can solve these technical difficulties and Graham is famous for pioneering in the area of modelling plant biophysics so that we can understand how cells, whole plants and forests work. And so that we can create more water use efficient crops and prepare ourselves for living in an atmosphere that is higher in carbon dioxide. So yeah. uh, some key examples of Graham's major contributions to science include his work in deriving and recently refining the carbon isotope discrimination model. He has given the world tools for determining carbon dioxide diffusion properties within the mesophyll, along with a multitude of other advances that we don't have time to go through all of them today, reported in over 300 papers. His research has been acknowledged with many accolades. For example, the Prime Minister's Prize for Science and a Kyoto Prize, and more recently an Australian of the Year Prize. So let's hand over now to Graham to help us learn more today about how plants economize in relation to their exchange of water for carbon. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, well today I want to speak about the exchange of water for carbon dioxide. Are land plants economical? But first I'd like to pay my respects to Bob Bandersky, 
who discovered PET provoxylase. And there's a picture of Bob as I knew him in Michigan State in, uh, in the 70s. Anyway, he was a great scientist. For, we all know that plants uh, play a vital role and uh, photosynthesis is required for food, fuel and fiber, liberation of oxygen that we breathe for respiration, but it also requires a lot of water. The inside of a leaf is moist, and if the cells inside the leaf were exposed directly to the air, they would rapidly desiccate. So plants have evolved a cuticle to cover the leaf surface and stop water loss. Cuticle, by the way, cuticular conductance is, is becoming a, a, an area of great importance because it's obviously the last resort when leaves dry out. And so there's a lot of uh, emphasis on cuticular conductance and a student with me here, Diego Marquez, is, is making great progress in that area. But plants nevertheless do need the atmospheric carbon dioxide, so they've evolved valves called stomata that allow CO2 to enter and inevitably allow some water to be lost by evaporation from inside, called uh, transpiration. Here we see stomata of a dicotyledonous leaf, and here's a, a monocot a grass, which in this case is, is wheat. The water used by plants is massive. It's by far the majority of uh, the, fate, it's the, the largest fate pool for, for water that falls on, on the terrestrial part of the Earth's surface. And uh, it's only a minority that goes back as directly as evaporation or as, or as rivers. So plant transpiration turns out to be really important uh, in terms of global climate. And, and of course, as many of you will know, water is the greatest single limitation on, on plant growth. In my thesis in 1973, I, sorry, there was a, a preview there of Ian Cowan, who's my supervisor. But in my thesis in 73, I, I wondered why stomata have a particular aperture or why leaves have a particular stomatal conductance. And so I thought, well, if you would, if you, if you'd open the stomata slightly, increase the conductance by delta G, then the assimilation rate would go up by delta A with a positive benefit. This is, this is the, the, uh, the assumption a positive benefit of P times delta A, where delta A is the increase in assimilation rate. And similarly, the opening will cause an increase in transpiration rate E of delta E with a negative benefit. This is, this is the supposition that I had. So it was a cost of N, N for negative benefit, N times delta E. Now the nature of the cost was it wasn't discussed, and, but it's become an active area of research and see papers by Tom Buckley and watch out for one coming from Ross Deans. At an optimal stomatal conductance, presumably then, potential benefits would be matched by potential costs. And so P times the small change in assimilation rate would be matched by N times the small increase in transpiration rate. And so mathematically, you, you can write that as P delta A over delta G equals N delta E over delta G, or as we would think of it these days, partial DE DA, which is the ratio of DE to G divided by DA to G, is equal to P over N. In other words, tomato should operate to keep the ratio of the sensitivities of assimilation rate and transpiration rate to stomatal conductance constant at the value of P over N. Now here's Ian Cowan practicing social distancing in Hawaii in the 80s. And he was a, a brilliant scientist. And he, he took this idea further and asked the question about how should plants control the apertures of the stomata to assimilate the greatest amount of carbon dioxide for a given total water, water loss over a day. So that's a, a narrower a narrower definition of the of the problem than the one that I'd given in the thesis, but it's easier to understand and come and uh, to to 
to give rigorous mathematical definitions on. So in that, we treat transpiration as an expenditure still and CO2 assimilation rate as a, as a purchase, but we can use the calculus of variations. We say maximize assimilation rate, that's the integral of the assimilation rate with time, subject to the integral of the transpiration rate with, with time being a, co a particular constant. And that's equivalent to maximizing a the assimilation rate over time minus transpiration rate divided by this parameter lambda, and lambda turns out to be the same as, as p over n, with the positive benefit of the simulation rate divided of the change in simulation rate divided by a negative cost of the increase in, in transpiration. The optimal solution then is to shift the temporal pattern of expenditure of water around until no more carbon could be attained for a given total amount of water spent over the day. At this optimum trajectory, the effect of increasing expenditure, delta E, at one point of time, which requires minus delta E at some other time, always gives the same increase in A, given by delta E over lambda, and the same loss at the other time. And that amounts to a proof that DD, DDA equals lambda. So, as the salesman would say, always buy more carbon if the price is less than lambda moles of water per mole of carbon. So, so this equation, this, this relationship tells you unambiguously how to assimilate the most carbon over a particular period for a given amount of water loss. And it turns out to be the same if you, if you state the problem in a different way, how to, how to get the least transpiration for a given amount of carbon gain. And the same argument can be used for spatial variation as we've just used for temporal variation. If, uh, if the return on expending a marginal increase is d over lambda at one part of the leaf, then it should be the same for the rest of the leaf and for all the other leaves of a, of a particular plant. And so the slogan, buy more carbon if the price is less than lambda mold, water per mold carbon, still holds. So you one can see from that that in dry places where water is more valuable than in moist places, lambda should be smaller because you'd be willing to pay less, less water for the carbon in, in dry conditions. Well, how well do plants follow this economic ideal? Stomata open in the light and they close in the dark. Stomata close with increasing leaf to air vapor pressure difference. And Leaves with large photosynthetic capacity, large nitrogen content, have large stomatal conductance. That last point was discovered by Chin Wong, in, published in 1979. It's a brilliant set of data. The, 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 the graph there shows assimilation rate versus stomatal conductance for hundreds of, of maize plants. Each dot is a different plant. And four of them have been picked out to show what the relationship would be for that particular leaf if stomatal conductance were different from what actually obtained. And the, and the blacks, the, the bolder black squares show the place where the plant chooses to operate. So along all the along all those possible curves, plants choose to operate at a particular point, which, when joined up, is is almost a straight line between assimilation rate and stomatal conductance it's going through the origin and that implies the uh, intercellular CO2 concentration of those various leaves is all almost identical. I should point out that the, although the results shown on the left are maize, it's not a dwarf maize that, that uh, Chin's standing in there but that's rather a wheat, wheat field. But do plants always follow the, the ideal? Stomata should open if the CO2 concentration increases, but they don't. Several authors have combined the result that DDA equals lambda with other fixes to fit the observed result to CO2. See, for example, Belinda Medlin's old paper. And that, that's useful for large scale modeling. But I don't think we can avoid the 
the conclusion that stomata are not behaving optimally in that respect. Similarly, lowering the oxygen concentration increases the simulation rate, but stomata don't open as they should. Of course, stomata don't normally see changes in oxygen or carbon dioxide on a time scale that's relevant to plant water relations. And indeed, a plant probably interprets an increase in the CO2 concentration inside a leaf if it experiences it. It probably interprets it as resulting from, a, from reduced photosynthetic uptake. Maybe a cloud passed in front of the, the sun, or perhaps an insect just munched on the mesophyll. Either way, close the stomata. But what should the value of lambda be? What should p over n be? In the calculus of variations, lambda is a Lagrange multiplier. Many authors have complained that there's no way of knowing its value a priori. In principle, the answer appears to be simple. If water supply is the constraint, the plant should keep GDA constant at a value lambda, which ensures that the plant transpiration matches the constraint. And if carbon assimilation is the constraint, the constant value of DDA should be that which ensures that plant assimilation matches that constraint. And we see that here in this diagram from Ian Cowan, 1977. The top graph shows transpiration rate versus time, and the bottom graph is assimilation rate versus time. And each of those solid lines represents the the locus for a particular value of, of, of lambda. So the, the highest value of lambda 2000 and the lowest value is about 200. And you can see that as lambda decreases, uh, eventually we get to the point where the stomata are closed in the middle of the, of the, middle of the day for low values of, of, of lambda. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the water transpired over the total day and the value of lambda, or similarly looking at the, uh, the plots on, on the bottom, there's, there's a unique relationship between carbon assimilated per, per day and the value of lambda. And so in principle, one can say what the value of lambda has to be once one decides what the amount of water you want to spend over the day is and looks at the top graph to work out where, where lambda should be, or by, uh, to, by carbon assimilation using the bottom graph. But of course, calculating those, those graphs uh, isn't, as, isn't quite straightforward, because you have to know what assimilation rate would be for different stomatal conductances. And as the stomata open or closed, that changes the CO2 concentration inside the leaf. So we have to know how photosynthesis, what the rate of photosynthesis would be if the CO2 concentration inside the leaf were different from what actually occurs. When the stomata open, the transpiration rate goes up and the leaf cools somewhat. So we need to know the temperature effects on photosynthesis, as well, of course, as the, uh, the temperature of the the air and the, and the sunlight varies across the day. One has to know how photosynthesis responds to sunlight. Anyway, that's a very long-winded way of saying that we needed to develop ways of calculating how photosynthesis should change with stomatal conductance. And we needed that model to include all those metabolic effects on photosynthesis. And so that led uh, Joe Berry and myself. Joe was a visitor. Uh, from the Carnegie Institution, and later we were joined by Susanna von Kammerer, the PhD student with a background in mathematics, and we that was the motivation for developing the model of photosynthesis, uh, which is well known now. Basically, two, we we assumed that there was a there were two possible sources of variation: Rubisco activity and IEVP supply, and uh, that, that, that modelling of photosynthesis was needed to, to predict how, to make predictions for, for uh, optimal stomatal behaviour. 
For returning to DDA was done, but what about periods longer than a day? If the plant knew exactly when the next rain was coming, it should choose the constant value lambda that DDA should equal, such that it would almost run out of water as the next rain arrived. But plants don't usually know. They can, however, adopt to a particular, adapt to a particular environment, soil water holding capacity and statistics of rainfall. Between saturating and rain events, lambda should decrease with time, with the time constant being the average time between events. And Cowan's written about that, as has Aniki Makela, and we have some data that it's only a few decades old that we haven't published yet. Now, this graph shows work by Otto Langer and colleagues in the 70s, and I I included here because you can see for a particular species, say for example, Hamadus caperio on, on the left column, as the season progressed from 26th of April, 28th of July, 14th of September, and the soil dried out, you can see how the shape of the simulation rate versus time changed with increasing soil stress. It's very much just like a reduction of of lambda that we saw in the, in the previous slide. Now, complication it complicates the story because plants use water faster than would be optimal if they all shared nicely. The idea, I guess, is that it's better to use it than have it used by a competitor or lost by soil evaporation or drainage. This means that the value of lambda chosen by the plant, if it's in a in, if it's in a situation of competition, is, is likely to be greater than the value that would be chosen if it were by itself. And of course, there's much more to plant growth and reproduction than carbon assimilation and water use. Tom Buckley's written about this in several papers. And uh, I just mentioned before, Ross Deans et al. Um, has made some progress in that area. But let's see what the what we've discovered so far implies for managed plant growth. Effective water use versus efficient water use. That's an important distinction. We tend to use the word water use efficiency as if it's an inherently good thing. Well, it can be if water is limiting but it can be a bad thing if water's not limiting. So optimal water use means keeping DDA constant over a day and having it decline as soil water content decreases. So in an environment with frequent rain and deep soil, this means a large value of DDA and hence a large simulation rate, transpiration rates, stellar conductance, and a large intercellular CO2 concentration. So in such an environment, effectiveness here means a low transpiration efficiency, that's A over E. With infrequent rain and thin soil, effectiveness means a small value of DDA, a low intercellular CO2 concentration and a high transpiration efficiency. So the question is, how can we recognize such differences across genotypes? And this, this is where there's a, we see a role for the stabilized types of, of carbon. The, the diffusion of 12 CO2 through the air is, is 1.004 times faster than 13 CO2 through air. We say that's four per mil faster. That's the notation that we use. Similarly, the reaction of CO2 with uh, 12 carbon in the molecule, the reaction of that carbon dioxide molecule with IUP catalyzed by Rubisco is 1.030, in other words, 30, 30 per mil times faster than the reaction with a 13 CO2 molecule. That's because the extra neutron makes the chemical bond harder to create or break. So we expect that then the 12, the 12 C to 13 C ratio should be somewhere between 1.004 and 1.030. If we subtract one from that ratio, we get we get uh, capital delta. 
uh, uh, so we call carbon isotope discrimination. And so the carbon isotope discrimination delta should be somewhere you'd expect for C3 plants between 4 per mil and 3 per mil. The simplest description would be a 2n member equation, so it would be delta in per mil would be 4 plus 30 minus 4 times the CO2 concentration in the chloroplast divided by that in the atmosphere. And there was the first uh, proof. This was work with Marilyn Ball, who was a student at the time and had mangroves that tend to have a low intercellular CO2 concentration. And for the, even though they're growing in water, water is actually, it, it's like living in a place where, where, you, where the soil is dry because it, it's an effort to take the water out of the, out of the water salt mixture. And Susanna von Cameron was also a student at the time and she was working on Paisiolus vulgaris. And so by looking at leaves, gas exchange of leaves, comparing it with the isotopic composition of the carbon, we saw uh, a relationship which was in the right direction. So we realized that carbon isotope discrimination then was likely to help us identify plants with water use efficiency. Uh, by water use efficiency, I, I reiterate that that can be a good thing or a bad thing. But in, a, in a country like Australia, where there's so much dryland agriculture, it was obviously a, a, a great deal of interest for cases where it was useful. Anyway, the, 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 there's an equivalent expression for discrimination there, which is 30 minus 26 times the simulation rate divided by stomatal conductance. And that simulation rate divided by, I shouldn't say stomatal conductance, it's stomata plus mesophyll in, in series. But it's roughly proportional to the CO2 simulation rate divided by transpiration rate if you're comparing genotypes growing in the same conditions. So across genotypes, delta should be negatively related to, to water use efficiency. And that's what we saw um, in the right-hand graph. There's transpiration efficiency, that's gra grams of dry matter produced divided by uh, kilograms of water used plus against, against discrimination among peanut genotypes. It's a cross between Chico and, and uh, Tipton. And the, the negative relationship is, is as, a, as expected. And you can see that the transpiration efficiency heads towards zero when the discrimination is around about 28 or so per mil. In the left-hand side, we see work by Tony Condon in showing the same thing for wheat genotypes. The next slide shows, it's Tony second from the right, um, Greg Rubetsky on the right and Richard Richards next to, to me. And uh, that was during the time when we set about trying to find wheat with a with greater water use efficiency. And, uh, Apart from peanut and, and wheat, the, the genetic variation in carbon isotope discrimination and its relationship to transpiration efficiency has been seen in lots of, particularly in crops, but also in um, tree species. And um, Richard and his team at CSRO developed the wheat variety Drysdale. And that was the first variety released with this property of water use, the improved water use efficiency. That was done in 2002. And it's interesting, you can see that the, that the, the process of going from the physiological discovery to the release of a variety can be as frustratingly long, it's about 20 years. Anyway, since then, Reese was released in 2003, and there have been recent commercial releases of Scouts, Pittsburgh and Longridge since that time. Here's the advertisement that uh, CSRO used for this new wheat Drysdale. I should comment that Drysdale sounds like it might be referring to a dry field, but uh, Drysdale was a famous Australian 
artist and Richard is very keen on art and he's trained artists. And there's the, the drover's wife. It certainly does pick up the, the drought that was around, uh, around about 1945. Since that time, Josette Marl and her student Scott Gilmore identified a gene, a rector, controlling transformation efficiency in Arabidopsis. And that's apparently been confirmed in wheat by uh, another group, 2015. Moving from carbon to oxygen, it turns out that the, the oxygen isotope composition of leaf water and indeed leaf dry matter is also useful in this context. It, it, it's, it happens that heavy water with an 18O or a deuterium, the 2H, has a lower vapor pressure and also diffuses more slowly than h 2 And this leads to an enrichment of leaf water over source water. There's an expression for it there. As where the epsilon k is the kinetic fractionation and the epsilon plus is the, the vapor pressure fractionation. Enriched leaf water causes an enrichment in the organic oxygen of the plant, but it also enriches atmospheric oxygen. That's the dole effect, or part of the dole effect, that the uh, atmosphere is about 23 per mil enriched compared to the ocean. And atmospheric carbon dioxide is also enriched by plants. Plants with low stomatal conductance turns out have 18 and O enriched leaf water and organic matter because the, uh, the stomatal, for, for two, a couple of reasons, the low stomatal conductance means that, that this, that the stomata place more resistance on diffusion than on the boundary layer. And the fractionation through, through stomata is greater than through the boundary layer. It also means that the, the temperature of the leaf is increased when the low, when the stomatal conductance is low, and a higher temperature means a higher, means a lower relative humidity, and that causes a 18O enrichment. So Margaret Barber, when she was a student, took advantage of this. We analysed the O18 in organic matter of wheats that were grown by Tony Fisher and Ken Sayer in uh, Cimit in Mexico. There was there was an interest in how much of improvement of the uh, wheats from the 60s until the late 80s, how much of that was caused by genetics and how much was it caused by agronomy. And of course it was a mixture of both. But Part of that study involved growing, growing genotypes that have been released at different times. And on the, apps, on the ordinate there, we've plotted the enrichment of the organic matter. And you can see that as tomato conductance increased with, with time of release of, of the, uh, the wheats, the, the enrichment of of O18 decreases, and that's very well co correlated with the, the increase in grain yield over that period. So the so the conclusion is that the grain yield improvement of the cement wheats, where the blue, where the um, Nobel Prize winning work of Phil and Bollard led to the Green Revolution, it's involved. It's involved increasing the assimilation rate, but that in itself has been helped by presumably hydraulic changes in the plant that have enabled it to have higher stomatal conductance. And the two things together give, have given rise to this uh, impressive increase in, in yield over that, over that period. So it turns out that measuring the O18 was. Uh, was the clearest indication of physiological measure of the increase in, in transpiration efficiency. Delta 13 C also went the way you'd, you'd expect. So my takeaway message today is that 
Research in plant physiology involves physics, mathematics, chemistry, as well as botany, molecular biology, micrometeorology, soil science, and other fields. Theoretical plant physiology is starting to develop, but needs to be strongly connected to experimental studies. I write that because when I finished my physics as an undergraduate and decided to become a plant, plant physiologist, I thought it would be nice to, to have a field that was analogous to theoretical physics. Anyway, we've got a way to go, but it's a, it's a great deal of fun. So I'd like to thank Planting and the people who've organised the, uh, this terrific series. And uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Graham. That was fantastic, and, and it's an excellent uh, privilege for all of us to be able to learn from you. Um, you know, for you to share with us your insight in how to think about plants economising in relation to carbon capture and opportunity uh, relative to their water loss costs. So that's awesome. Uh, with the technical difficulties, we're running a little bit behind on time. There is the opportunity for people to include questions and send these through for subsequent answer. So we'll just limit it to one quick question at this stage, uh, which is, um, Graham, what are your thoughts in in relation to uh, how much there is potential for there to be changes, say, for example, in membrane uh, folding and pulling in and out of different transport proteins into membrane locations that could influence things like, for example, bicarbonate transport. How do you think those sort of changes um, could be explored in the future experimentally to understand how much they influence what's happening in terms of uh, looking at mesophyll diffusion? Well, that's a, that's a question out of left field for me. <laughs> Um, I guess it depends what the, uh, the membranes are. I mean, uh, one can use model systems with membranes, um, you know, giant algal cells, or if it's if it happens to be a thylakoid membrane, of course, there's all sorts of marvelous techniques that are available because uh, photosynthesis and light reactions and Electron transports going on in uh, in thylakoid reactions, but for membranes in general, um, I'd go to a membrane biophysicist who's likely to be a bit more educated on that area than I am. I'm sorry, that's a very weak answer, especially. For <laughs> <the area. laughs> no worries. Thank you. So um, all the rest of the questions we'll have to follow up in um, subsequently. Um, and thank you again, Graham, for your for your uh, time and insight. So up next, uh, we have uh, our second speaker for today, uh, Assistant Professor Senia Krasleva from the University of California, Berkeley. So Senia's expertise is in the area of genomics, plant immunity and plant microbe interactions. She's a recipient of a USDA National Institute of Food and Agricultural Postdoc Fellowship and has made major contributions in wheat functional genomics and wheat super hard, so that's impressive. Her work in this area has been recognised with the Carlotta Award. She's led her own group since 2014. So today, Senny is gonna take us on a plant immunity journey so we can learn about perception of pathogen molecules and what changes they induce in host plant cells. And we're going to learn about the interplay between gaining new immune specificity versus retaining autoimmunity. So uh, thank you, Senia, take away. Thank you for a very kind introduction and all of you for joining today wherever you are. And I hope you're safe here in California. We still have shelter at home, so I'm joining from my own house. And I'm... Um, I'm going to switch gears a bit and uh, talk about the plant immune system and the plant immune receptors. Um, just to confirm, can you see me advance the slides? Okay. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, plant immunity relies on the arsenal of receptors. Those are innate receptors encoded in the germline that are shared on um, with other organisms, including um, animals. 
in in plants those are the the sources those are the genes that are providing the same specificity to recognize same pathogens that are rapidly evolving as attack all the other organisms with uh, other types of immune systems such as adaptive immunity so for me the major long-standing question um that uh, drives the research uh, for me personally is how do plants given only the um germline encoded immunity are capable of recognition of such diverse pathogens what we know from about 30 years of research on this topic is that uh, the major class of immune receptors called nls and they have a common domain architecture that makes it easy to identify them in genomes they act inside the plant cell and they recognize the presence of the pathogen either directly by binding pathogen-derived molecules that are injected inside the plant cell or indirectly by monitoring the homeostasis of the host cell and um, being able to monitor host proteins and the modifications that the pathogens do on the host cell um, to uh, promote uh, disease. And so uh, in our terms, we've uh, now recognizing these um, NLRs or plant immune receptors that directly bind the molecules or indirectly monitor the receptors. We had um, very nice and interesting additions to the plant immune receptors when um, we showed, and I'm going to talk about it a bit today, that the receptors themselves can be fused to other plant proteins. And instead of monitoring them, um, just by binding them, they have incorporated uh, pathogen targets inside the architecture of the receptors, and that we call them integrated domain. And even more recently, what's been shown is that um, unlike those sensors that are at the front line of uh, monitoring for the pathogens, there are also other immune receptors, NLR immune receptors, that act as helpers. They help to transduce the signal downstream. Now, when we um, analyze and when we think about the immune system analyzed the genome um, we're guided by the three main principles that the functional immune system whatever it is whatever organism it is it relies on generating the diversity of the receptors and in plants that uh, diversity is generated on the population level and then when the pathogen comes the um, variants that provide that are capable of the recognition provide the resistance and lead um, to survival of those plants. So those are pretty simple concepts. And then the question that we ask then, what contributes to those NLI diversity on the genomic level? And again, the this protein family is absolutely fantastic. You can study almost any um, Gen biology of any genomes by looking at those receptors. Uh, there's a lot of copy number variation, allelic variation, including point mutations, gene conversions, and as I mentioned, gene fusions, as well as a very complex epigenetic and post-transcriptional variation in their regulation. So today I'm going to talk to you very quickly about a few stories from the lab on a published and an unpublished story that look at those mechanisms. So the copy number variation, those NLR immune receptors vary quite extensively. And the graduate student, Erin Bags, uh, in my lab, she uh, surveys constantly all the new genomes that are coming out. And you can see here the 94 plant genomes um, and the number of NLRs they have. And she showed that plants can have as few as just one immune receptor and still survive and still be fine and resist pathogens or as many as thou literally thousands of them. And the question that Erin asked, and um, her study has been just published in the plant cell, so I'm, I'm going to spend only a few minutes on it, but you, I do um, urge you to go and read it because it's quite a fantastic study. Erin asked, if plants lose immune receptors, why and do they also lose immune signaling pathways? And indeed, what she's able to show that in rarely in a few organisms, including a couple of aquatic species uh, coming from flowering plants, there is a loss of those NLI immune receptors is accompanied by the loss of 
immune signaling components and one of the major components known in our plant immunity. And very nicely then Erin went and uh, mined those genomes and mined that diversity and the reoccurrent loss, convergent loss, for uh, potential new components of the immunity. One of the pressing questions as well when we look at the plant genomes um, is we can now sequence almost anything in, in, um, that, that's um, available. Um, how can we um, deduce from just sequence, looking at the sequence of those receptors, whether uh, how the, do they function uh, and what is the mode of um, action? And one of the key features of the immune receptors that are fused to other uh, proteins to the baits monitoring for the pathogen is this unusual domain architectures. We first noticed it uh, looking quite early, looking actually at wheat, and uh, there we noticed when we build uh, networks of protein similarity networks, we noticed that a big blob that represents a protein family here of NLRs has connection to other uh, families. And what those connections are, those are gene those are gene and protein fusions. And the next probably five years spent looking and seeing whether this is an artifact or real. And at the same time, there's been several reports um, that analyze that indeed those novel exogenous fusions of different domains into the immune receptors, they're functional and they serve, they give immune receptors baits to recognize the pathogens. So we characterized um, those fusions in all the plant uh, genomes that were available at that time and we saw indeed quite a diversity of them. And the next question we asked um, was, well, is that um, something that's just reoccurring to all genes or to all receptors, or are there any specialist receptor types that are more prone to those fusions? And it turned out that indeed the latter, uh, this, um, our hypothesis about specialist clade was um, correct. And while there is a low rate of new domain acquisitions throughout the evolution of NLRs, um, there are specialist clades of the receptors that acquire those domains quite rapidly. And again, that's um, a study that's also published. So I, um, if you have, um, if you're interested, please go and read about it. We still don't know the mechanism, how this happens, but I think this is quite an exciting territory for engineering new immune receptors and creating new fusions. And the main story that I wanted to share today is um, uh, still an unpublished story, and it's a collaboration with a structural biologist, uh, Daniel Prigozhin, who brought um, a, a structure plus perspective into looking at those receptors. Because at the end, when we look at the genomes and we look at the proteins and the natural diversity encoded in them, that diversity actually translates in a three-dimensional space. And here um, we took um, a view of again looking at the plant immunity in um, uh, re relative to the other immune systems and what you can see is that in our own in um, the anti immunity based on antibodies you know there is a constant part and there is a hyper variable part and that would allow us to track the pathogens it turns out that the adaptive immunity of lampreys of lower fishes is based on somatic recombination of loose and rich repeats. And again, those loose and rich repeats uh, give them ability to recognize any epitope, uh, 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 anything that's out there. In plants, we have innate immune system that is based on the loose and rich repeats, but then um, given enough diversity, those loose and rich repeats might be able also to recognize absolutely anything such as the adaptive immune system there. So we decided um, to look and to get as close as the diversity generation here to uh, look at specifically the allelic diversity in the loose and rich repeats. And um, last year, a fantastic data set came out that enabled this analysis uh, for the first time. And um, that's a data set of looking at the NLR immune receptors in uh, Arabidopsis accession um, with the long read sequencing. 
So what we decided to do, we decided to um, look at the, and develop measures of diversity um, as closely as we can uncouple it from this selection. And so the measure we use is uh, Shannon Entropy. It's used to measure diversity in many different disciplines, so you might have heard about it, but it hasn't been applied uh, to plant immune system yet. Um, to study uh, allelic diversity, we needed to break the um, immune receptors into clades. And uh, here, the commonly used um, algorithms um, are often ineffective because immune receptors in plants can evolve at various rates. So what we decided to do, we decided to take a phylogeny-based approach and build a phylogeny of all the immune receptors from all Arabidopsis accession and develop an algorithm that would cut that tree and um, look at the cl uh, clades of um, those NLRs. And we've uh, basically walked this tree from inward to outward, and then we split the clades to make sure we retain um, about one allele from each representative accession. And what we noticed is that closely related genes can evolve at quite different uh, rates. You have here um, a representative of an immune receptor called RPP8 and another on RPP1. They're known uh, disease-resistant genes that track pathogens, but their clo very close relatives are quite invariable. So when we looked further into that, we um, deployed the Shannon entropy to calculate the amount of variability. And what this shows is it shows um, the calculation of the entropy, which is essentially a sum of um, the fractions of each amino acids found uh, in, a, in a column at the positions. So if, if there is a um, column that has low variability, there's low entropy, et cetera. If, if there's a high variability, there's high entropy. So with that, we can develop, we, we have a measure of looking at precisely at the variability in each of these immune receptors and in each of the positions in each of these receptors. And what we saw is that um, throughout the evolution of NLRs, there are those highly variable clades. They um, have a very high rate, have very high diversity. And often, quite often, right next to them, there would be very quiet clades as well. Um, and it, uh, those highly variable and a lot they're found, they're not found in the helpers, so they're not found in the signal transducers. And um, they usually they included all of the direct binders, all of the uh, those proteins involved in direct recognition of the receptors that uh, were known in Arabidopsis. What became even more interesting is that those highly variable NLRs perfectly all overlapped with uh, previously characterized hybrid and compatibility loci from detlef Weigel's group. And on what it told us that this um, high rate of diversification essentially comes at a cost, but it also told us that by looking at that sequence variation alone, we can predict uh, the direct binders, these proteins that would be involved in direct recognition of the pathogen, you might be able pr to predict those that come at a cost that would be uh, involved in the hybrid incompatibility. Now, I told you that we also were interested in looking at this allelic variability in a structural context. And here we were able to use the Shannon entropy to look at the highly variable sites in those loose and reach repeats. And we observed that they cluster together on the concave surfaces of the LLRs and they have all the properties of binding sites. So to us, what it tells that by looking at sequence variation, those receptors and the diversity generated there, we can possibly also predict um, not only the mode of uh, pathogen recognition, but also the binding sites there. And what um, it, it begs also a question of what came first? Um, this recognition of the pathogen or monitoring of um, your own uh, homeostasis and catching the pathogen that way. And the conclusion I have from analyzing this data is that uh, possibly plant immune system is not that different from other immune system. 
And the generation of this diversity that can has the potential to recognize anything evolved first. And therefore, we still have those genes that keep running and keep trying to catch any new danger signal. But all, an indirect recognition and recognition of your own proteins evolved from that. It's essentially recognition of yourself rather than non-self. And it, of course, it came at, at a cost that um, uh, some of the combinations give to autoimmunity and therefore are dangerous. And um, consistent with that, um, the, there are very closely related uh, immune receptors. One is known involved in direct recognition of the pathogens. Another is uh, a canonical receptor involved in the indirect recognition and a structure that has been solved with its binding partner. And what we see is that in the indirect recognition, uh, there is no variability. And here's the known binding site. And here on the right is the protein involved in direct recognition, and here's the Shannon entropy. And it perfectly overlaps with the binding site, supporting our conclusions. So as a summary of what I told you today is that plant immune receptors are fantastic, and plants deploy several mechanisms of uh, diversification. Analog lays vary a lot in the amount and type of the diversity, and we you know, there are so many things we know. I think there are many more exciting discoveries yet to be made. This highly variable analogs are likely sources of new resistance, and they also contain autoimmune alleles. Uh, and in plants, recognition of modified self likely evolved from the recognition of non-self. And now, uh, by looking at the sequencing data, uh, we can make hypotheses and infer the mode of NLR function uh, just by analyzing analyzing um, the diversity in any species. With that, um, I want to thank my lab, um, especially Erin Baggs, uh, who's a fantastic PhD student, um, and I've showed some of her research, she has many more projects. Yunina, who is a postdoc in the lab working in NLR engineering, and um, our collaborator, Daniel Prigozhin, who did the Shannon entropy analysis and structural analysis. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Senia, for taking us into your cutting edge breakthrough resolving receptor and effector specificities. It's absolutely superb, the um, range of techniques that you've used to, to make so much uh, awesome progress in that area. Uh, so moving into questions. So there's a question for you in relation to, um, you know, so you've made some observations in wheat. Um, have in a resistant plant um, of, of the uh, certain species that's, um, uh, say for example, um, if a resistant plant of the same species as a susceptible plant doesn't show a classical hypersensitive response, um, so macro or microscopic, but is otherwise not uh, infected by the target pathogen, how else uh, could we describe and characterize NLR mediated resistance? Mm, I think that's a fantastic question. I, um, I'm really fond of NLRs, but I think they're not the only way plants can defend themselves. And I think Aaron's work shows that quite nicely. There are plants alive that have lost NLRs completely, yet they're still surviving. Similar, like plants don't have the antibodies and they're still surviving and overall they have the NLRs. So first of all, I, I think we should distinguish the NLR-mediated immunity activation versus non-NLR defense responses. And we know um, uh, more about the NLRs. Um, and the second, in, uh, if it's the plant immune receptor eliciting the response, uh, commonly we do observe hypersensitive reaction and cell death, localized cell death. Uh, but that's not the only response, and there's a, absolutely the um, changes in gene expression and other phenomena. And I think um, it's still a very open question that I remember uh, when I was a PhD student, my PhD advisor was uh, asking me, we still don't know exactly what stops the pathogen. Mm -hmm. We don't know what are the molecules or what is the exact mechanism that restricts pathogen growth and I think that cell death is not the only answer. 
Awesome, thank you. And um, in your recent um, annual review of plant biology, you indicated that engineering of NLRs has proven difficult. And it, it made me wonder, um, do you think there's also opportunity to learn from other sort of uh, effector receptor binding relationships that are outside of the plant kingdom? Like, so for example, how you know pathogens recognize each other and how some animals rec recognize pathogens and sort of borrow borrow from that in the context of of the engineering approach what are your thoughts oh on absolutely that? absolutely i think engineering of plant immunity um is the next wave i hope we'll see a lot of progress in it from many different labs in the upcoming years and upcoming decade i think that the ability for us to synthesize anything we want mm. basically removes the barriers. We're just limited by our creativity. Um, and if you think about it, the antibody engineering is a 10 billion industry. We still don't have the same or anything close when it comes to the plant system. So, and I, I don't think there will be a single answer. I think there will be multiple very creative answers. So. Awesome. Thank you, Senia, and thank you, Graham. Two fantastic talks today. And I'll hand back now to Katie. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for joining us as speakers, and thank you all in our audience for, for joining us to listen in. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be posted within a couple of days, and we'll also be sending a follow-up email with certificates of attendance for all of you who have joined. Um, thanks again, and we'll see